All right. Well, this morning we're going to start out with taking a look at some uh, statistics here. The Cultural Research Center uh, is housed at Arizona Christian University, uh, and it's headed up by someone that uh, I'm pretty familiar with, and many of you may be, uh, Dr. George Barna. Uh, he is a, a Christian um, pollster, and he, he does all kinds of uh, studies and written many, many books uh, on uh, uh, different uh, scenarios happening within the church and within families and, and all of that. And, and he runs this cultural research center. Uh, and they put out in 2020 what's called the American Worldview Inventory. Uh, and I wanted to share with you all this morning, at the beginning of this message, the main findings uh, that, that they found in, in 2020. Uh, maybe a little difficult uh, uh, to read, but the, the things on the left side there are the kind of the questions uh, and points that they were uh, asking people. And the first one says, having faith matters more uh, than which faith you have. Okay, uh, and as you can see, that uh, 63% of all American adults said that it really didn't matter what faith you had, as long as you had some faith. Okay, uh, and then it breaks it down as you go through there what type of church you attend, evangelical, um, a Pentecostal, uh, Catholic, Baptist, and it's, and it's got several of them there. And then it breaks it down on your political ideology, whether you're conservative, moderate, uh, or, or liberal. Um, but, but 63%, uh, that, that lines up with what I would think, that the vast majority of people believe that, hey, whatever faith that you got, it's better to have faith than not have any faith uh, at all. So that, when it means faith, that's talking about any kind of religious uh, belief system. Uh, and then it says, you consciously and consistently try to avoid sinning because you know your sins break God's heart. Uh, that seemed to be kind of encouraging. 56% of all adults uh, said that they try to avoid sinning. Uh, and so that's, that's okay. Uh, and then it says, you have a personal responsibility to appropriate, uh, to, in appropriate situations to share your religious beliefs with people who believe differently than you. And 49% said uh, that they, they agreed uh, with, with, with that, that you have a personal responsibility to do it where it's appropriate. Now, the problem with that is that that's less than half, Right. Less than half of, I mean, 49%, less than half of people polled thought that you have a personal responsibility. I hope if I poll you today, it's 100% of you to realize, especially the way this is worded, because it's worded pretty good, uh, that you have a personal responsibility in appropriate situations to share your religious beliefs with people who believe differently uh, than you. I mean, the Great Commission has to be done, right? Jesus gave us the Great Commission, uh, and that's something we ought to do, but only 49% said they'd do that. Then it says, a person who is generally good or does enough good things for others will earn a place in heaven. 48%. 48%. And, and again, not too crazy that, that that's, what you're, that's what you're seeing, uh, but nevertheless, uh, these are the statistics. Uh, the, and and you, can you earn a place in heaven? Mm, I don't think so. Um, then the last one says, you consider yourself to be a Christian, and when you die, you will go to heaven only because you have confessed your sins and have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. 33%. A third of people believe that, that heaven comes because of your faith in Jesus Christ alone, not by works, lest any man should boast, you know, uh, 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 that scripture. Um, and, and so these, I'm assuming that the other uh, two-thirds uh, would, would, would go in with the 48% that thought that, hey, your, your good deeds can earn you a way uh, in, into heaven. Now, George Barna, uh, I put a quote in here that I, I think he was pretty upset about these results because I read his entire uh, remarks. And let me tell you what he says here. Um, he says, by abandoning our, first of all, right before this quote, he said, there are two documents that hold our country together. Number one's the Bible, and number two is the Constitution, okay? His point in the paragraph above this quote uh, in, this, uh, in this report they put out was, we're eroding both of those documents, 
okay? Uh, and he says, by abandoning our moral standards and traditions and replacing them with inclusive and conditional preferences, we are losing the foundations that have enabled the American experiment to succeed for more than two centuries. We can only hope that our critical moral institutions, particularly the family and churches, will wake up and help the nation get back on we could only hope that that would be the case. Because the numbers, people, and I have been, I've been probably quoting statistics around this for uh, at least the past uh, 15 years, and they just continue to get worse and worse and worse uh, when it comes to people's engagement. I can see it in my own uh, just case study. You can see it. You know it's true. Uh, that There are a lot of people that claim to be Christian, that claim religion, right? Uh, but they don't really understand everything uh, in the proper way, I should say. Uh, everybody wants to go to heaven. Uh, you ever been to a funeral where they said the person bust tail wide open? Mm -mm. Yeah. Last Tuesday, I want to tell you that Mr. Smith has just got his place in the fiery depths of hell. I've done about 42 funerals. I never said that about any of them. Has there been one in that 42 probably that is there? I'd probably have to say yeah. I don't know which one, but I'd probably have to say statistically speaking, but I certainly didn't get up there and say that. Uh, I also do not get up there and say, if I have a, if I have a, I can't know, but if I, if I have a little bit of a suspicion that this person maybe not, I also do not say unequivocally that they are in heaven either. Okay, uh, I don't say, i tell you what, I know that right now Mr. Smith is basking in the presence of the Almighty God. I don't do that. What I tell people is that Mr. Smith had the opportunity and you have the same opportunity, people, that are out here to be able to do that. And if you choose Jesus Christ in the way the Bible says, then you will be able to enjoy eternal life uh, in the same way, too. I'm going to talk about what the Bible uh, says because, let me ask you something this morning. Do you get the question that we're going to talk about, is what must you do to gain eternal life? And can you gain eternal life? Is it like catching COVID? Can, can a Christian breathe on you and you catch it? <laughs> you and that be great. We just go around, because, hey, it's certainly easier to spread diseases than it is the gospel, okay? Uh, can, you so say, we just go around sneezing on people. Can you get it genetically? Is there something in your genes that passed down? Because, you know, I had great grandparents and great parents. They were great, saved, born again, Bible-believing Christians. They went to camp meeting and they did all this stuff. And, and you grew up that way and you got, the, you got the same gene. You sure? Hmm. Okay. All right. So we can't get it, you know, it's not airborne. You, you can't get it from rubbing up on somebody. You can't catch it. It can't happen genetically. So you mean that it's a personal and individual responsibility and decision that you would have to make, right? Uh, all right. Uh, and, and there's some other thoughts uh, about soteriology out there too, uh, but we won't explore that at this point. Uh, so looking at the statistics today, though, I think it's good to look at this question uh, about what must you do to gain eternal life. Let's look at a young man who asked this question in Matthew chapter 19, uh, verses 16 uh, through uh, 22. Um, uh, it says, just then uh, a man came up to Jesus and asked, and Jesus just, had, just got finished talking about the little children. Uh, and after doing that, this man comes up to Jesus and he asks, Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, he inquired. Jesus replied, you should not murder, you should not commit adultery, you should not steal, you should not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, Go sell your possessions to give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad, because he had great wealth. Um, looking at this, if you notice in verse 16, uh, the man asked Jesus, 
what he could do. I mean, what, what must I do to get eternal life is his question. When we were studying Acts the other night, uh, uh, the, the jailer uh, that where uh, Paul and Silas had miraculously gotten out of prison, uh, when, when the jailer realized what had happened, he goes to them and he says, what must I do? To have eternal life. This is a question that several people have asked uh, in the Bible. And, and Paul tells them. And Jesus tells uh, this young man here uh, uh, several things. So, you know, when you look at, well, what does, what does Jesus really tell him? Does Jesus say, drop on your knees right here and pray that, and repeat after me? Did he say that? Let me, let me get you to the preacher and he's going to have you a scripted prayer. A, admit, B, believe, C, confess. And and then you're going to be saved. No, he tells him something he ought to do. The first thing he tells him, he says, if you want to enter life, he said, keep the commandments. Obey God, right? And, 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 and then when, when, he, he, when he says, you know, well, uh, he, he says, obey, obey the commandments. And he said, which ones? Which commandments? Now, you've got to understand, this is a Jew. There's not just 10. 600 and something Laws and commands, is that right, Jim, or something like that? 613, I was going to go 15, I would have been two over. 613 laws and commands that the Jews have out there to follow. He's going, which ones? Jesus names a few that are part of the Ten Commandments, and he goes, oh, man, I've been keeping those since I was a little kid. But, he, he did, he, he, now, can you say that? Even standing where, sitting where you are today, and you may be saved in here today, if Jesus was to say, keep the commandments, you go, oh, check, I got that. Doing good on that deal. He did. He said, I, I've, I've been doing that. All right? But he, he realized, though, that he still lacked something. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting about this, this young rich man's heart here, that he had been a commandment follower, but he realized that wasn't good enough. That he still felt lacking in something. And so yeah, he asked that question, what do I still lack in verse 20? And Jesus says, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor. That was the second thing that he told him. Number one, keep the commandments. He said, I got that. Sell your possessions and, and give, to the, give to the poor. Well, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't a good thing. Um, if you look at the statistics that I mentioned to you earlier, in the 48% of adults in the U.S. that feel they're good, good things to qualify them for eternal life, you would have thought that this guy had done enough good things by keeping the commandments that he'd be okay. But he had to do something extra. Um, and, and so what does the second requirement really mean? Does it really mean that you've got to... If, if, if you come in, you got a little money in the bank, say you got $5,000 in the bank, you get saved, you got to sell your house, your car, you know, your, your goats, and give all your money to the poor, and then you can be saved. Is that what it really means? Oh, I'm asking questions. I need you to give statements. That last part was a question. One second. What? You need to be willing to, hmm. That's interesting. I'll explore that in a minute. So, but I'm asking to do that, though, really. Because, mm. I mean, I know people in here, hopefully you got a little money in the bank. All right. You got, y'all drove a car. I didn't see anybody here, you know, walking. So we have some possession. So it can't mean that. Daniel said that you got to be willing to. You got to be willing to. Um, and I think that's what Jesus was drilling down with this rich young man, wasn't it? Because he told him two things. He said, you know, sell all the things that you have and give it to the poor. And he said, then what? Then come follow me. Then you'll be a follower of me. You got, that's, that is a requirement, right, to, to be a Christ follower, okay? Um, and, and I think in order for you to really understand Jesus' words uh, in verse 21, you need to look at Philippians 2, Okay. Uh, I go back to this a lot. I can quote it in J the King James and the, and the NIV, and sometimes I mix them both up because this is one that I've quoted, but I love the way that the New Living Translation says this as well. Uh, but in verses um, uh, 5 through 11, it says, You must have the same attitude uh, that Christ Jesus had. 
Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Uh, take a look at, at the, I highlighted it in your notes in verse 6. It says, though he was God, he did not think equality with God something to be clinging to. The 1984 edition of the NIV says that, that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. All right? Uh, and, and so when I, I put in your notes this, in order for us to have the ability to be saved, Jesus had to loosen his grip on heaven and humble himself to this earth. If he had just stayed there, if he had not left his position on high and come down here to live the way he did, to die as a substitutionary atoning sacrifice for me and you, we would still be lost and undone if he kept his grip on heaven. But he turned it loose and he humbled himself in the form of a human being and that meant that it was going to be a really difficult existence for him for 33 and a half years at least. And he did that so you and I can be saved. So what does he require of us? Here we go. There we go. So... To say that again, well, you got to do something with that now. In order for us to have the ability to be saved, I am way louder than Ken. Uh, we must loosen our grip on things of this world and humble ourselves. If you think for one single solitary second, and I said second, and I don't usually do that, second, that you're going to be able to keep clinging to everything in this world that you hold dear and you're going to make it into heaven, you're going to be walking away as sad as that young man did from Jesus Christ. Examine yourself this morning. How much of the world are you holding on to? You know, it pains me to hear people say things like, I'm ready to go to heaven, just not right now. I just, I want to see this, or I want to see that. And I understand. I understand. I have three small children. I'd love to walk Ansley down the aisle. I mean, there's all of those things, y'all. I, I get that we'll say that sometimes. But you know how stupid that is when we say that? And I get it. I, I've, I've kind of thought that kind of stuff, too. But what you're saying is, let me tarry on this earth longer and wait longer for ultimate salvation. I mean, if you really think about that, you're going to go, I don't think so. I'm sure that every person that's passed away thought, hey, there's one more thing they'd like to do, but let me ask you something. Go to heaven right now if we could and ask any of them if they'd like to come back for one more millisecond. Lazarus, you think about him? He already made it. Next thing you know, a couple of days later, Lazarus, come forth. I got to go back? Got to die again? I mean, never, nobody ever thinks about poor old Lazarus and he had to go twice. Okay? And all the other people that were raised from the dead. You got Craig? <laughs> You're right, there you go. There you, there you go. It gives, yeah, gives you an absolute per That's right. I was there, and here, here you are. Shocked me back. God had to send her back. Um, but... But when you, if, if you think about the things, really and truly, I want you to think about it. Am I holding on to wanting, let's just use me for that, for example. Am I holding on to want to walk Ansley down the aisle so much that I don't want to go to heaven before I have the ability to do that, if that's what God's will was? That that's gonna, is that something, couldn't that be something that I could cling to here? You know? What, 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 about, what about you say, well, I, I want to, I want to see this. I want to do this. I want to experience this. What is it in your life this morning that you are clinging to 
that's a ball and chain on you wanting to move forward in your in, in your in your salvation. What what are those and so not not just that, but what are those things that are holding you back? What are those sinful things, maybe? What are those um, uh, habits we have? What are, what are those hobbies that we have that are worldly in nature that are preventing us from being go, and going to the next level of what God wants us to be doing in our Christian life? One of the questions in, in the Sunday school uh, this morning was, uh, or the live it out section of your Sunday school book, by the way, well, was to have a summary if y'all look at that in your Sunday school books, if you were there, and, and it was to you know look at what what is it? What is your purpose? What is it that you're supposed to be doing? And 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 I've gone through this, folks, in my life. There, my my job and career situation. I knew that something had to change if I was going to keep doing what God wanted me to be doing. I had to choose what, whether Corey was going to do something and be successful and have a whole lot more extra money uh, on there and make sure that I, was, I could say, oh, I've got it, yeah, I'm good, everything's good, or I was going to step out on a little bit of faith and give up some stuff uh, for, for what God had. Was that was me holding on to that? Was that something I should have continued to cling to? And there are people sitting in this room today, there may be somebody standing right here in, the, in this room today, that you have something in this world a pleasure, a hobby, a person, something that is happening in your life that's holding you back spiritually in this world. And I'm telling you that if you go up and you ask Jesus the same question this young man asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's going to tell you the same things. Obey me. Be willing to give up everything. Ken was right in what he's saying. His point is, and, 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 and what uh, Daniel said, you got to be willing to give up everything, not just your personal possessions, okay, but your spiritual you know, things, those, those ideologies that you have. I know I'm right about this. If God comes in and he shows you that it's a different way, you got to give it up. You've got to be willing to totally surrender to Jesus Christ. He wants, he wants and he has deserved your absolute surrender. Is that hard to do? Sure. But you say, well, God, I know you told me that I should forgive, but I can't forgive that person. Is that going to gain you a ticket? I don't think so. Harboring that unforgiveness because you think, well, I've rationalized it enough that I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, uh, so if you're saved today, but you've over time there's something you've been tightening your grip on, you, you need to let go. You need to let you need to let go. Uh, and and it's important, folks. Today I'm come, I'm going to come down here to finish this up for you. <clears throat> there's a lot of people. There are people in this room today that you think you're saved and you're not. There are people in this room today, and I'm just going based on statistics, not looking at any one person in particular, because I really don't know. If I spend a little bit of time, I may be able to, just in my own view, fill a pew up up here with some people that I thought were at da in danger, but I can't know. And the people that I didn't pick, I may have gotten wrong. But I just know st statistically, there are people in this room right now with just what we have that you think that you're a Christian. You think because at one point that you went down to an altar somewhere and you repeated a prayer by a preacher that somehow that gained you a ticket, but you may have lied to God. How is it that people come and get resaved? I don't understand that. You need to get resaved? What happens is the first time when you said it, you lied, right? You said I surrender, but you didn't. So you think you got to do it again because now this time maybe you got to tell the truth. Well, tons of people, folks, can lie. It's not once prayed, always saved. That's not true. When you surrender, when you're able to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm giving it all up. When I totally believe. Now, what Paul told that jailer is you believe in Jesus Christ. And the belief portion is not just to have a head knowledge. It's been said many times, you'll miss heaven by eight inches, the difference between your head and your heart. And there are people that are in this room, and it just, i got to say it. That I, my, the main thing that God would have me is not that you're prepared for a natural disaster. 
Now that you're prepared for, for the, the, the civil war that's going to potentially come to this country and you've got to have a bunch of guns and ammunition and all that other kind of stuff, the main thing that I've got, that's my responsibility when I stand before Christ is to make sure that you know that you need to be spiritually secure. And so I have to remind you at different points throughout, and you may think, maybe, oh, I'm saved, I'm good. Really examine yourself, young people, those of you here today. Are you saved? And you know one of the best ways to know that is just look at your life, how you're living it. Not about how you think. Look at your life. If somebody, I used to ask my youth, you gave one question survey to the people that you work with, to people that you play with, one question is put your name there, a Christian, yes or no? What would the people say? Not the people at church, the people that you're with all the time. What would they say? How many would check yes? How many would check no? Because they know how you really act when you're not trying to clean up. And would, would every single person, every single time check yes for me? Sometimes they may go, ooh, I don't know. He, he sure acted wrong that day. Yeah, you're going to have that sometimes. But, folks, you've got to understand this. It is not, we established this earlier, you can't get it because you showed up at church enough times. You can't get it because you're a preacher. You can't get it because you're going to get ordained as a deacon. You can't get it because you teach Sunday school. You can't get it because you, ride the, uh, you drive the bus. You can't get it because you teach the youth. You can't get it because you've been sitting in, I mean, you can't get it for any other way than you surrendering your heart to Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit rebirthing you. You get a new birth certificate. You're reborn. Your mind is renewed through the Holy Spirit. And unless that has happened, and, and let me just put it this way, if that has happened to you, you'll walk differently. And if you look back, I want everybody right now, if you think you're saved today, to look back to the time period you think that happened. Okay? You may not know the exact precise day and hour. Okay? But think about that time period. You should know the general period in which that should have happened. Is there a difference or have you gotten worse? Have you gotten better? I mean, the difference could be worse. So. Have you gotten worse? Or have you gotten better? You stayed flat? I'll submit to you this. If you have stayed flat and it has been a significant amount of years, you got a problem. Don't happen that way. Is your, is your curve straight up? Maybe not. But it, your, your sanctification process should be increasing. And it can only increase if you have the Holy Spirit helping you do that. Nothing can good happen without the Holy Spirit. And if you've been flat, no change. I don't know that that happens for very long with the Holy Spirit in your life. You say, 30 years I've been no different. 30 years you hadn't been saved. I'd submit to you. I can't know it. You've gotten worse. I can tell you you're not saved in that time. Think about it. And if you are not saved, if you don't have the assurance today that if the breath leaves your body, that you will translate from this life into the next and that you'll be with Jesus Christ get it right today no reason to wait till tomorrow get it right today churches are filled with people that are dying and going to hell and we got to make sure it's right for us and the biggest question you should make sure you ask your family it's not if you're a good person not if, oh, do you have a faith? Oh, I have a faith. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord? Are you saved? Put them on the spot and ask them. They'll have to answer. Think about how many people in your life you don't really know in your family. And it's our job to ask those, ask those questions. When we do the play, what are we doing but trying to tell the story of Jesus Christ? And, and, for, and, to, and to bring this to a lost and dying world. We will never change this country by continuing to just put our faith in unsaved politicians. We'll change the country by saved Christians doing the business of, of God and, and fulfilling their purpose and what they're supposed to be doing. And if we, <clears throat> the country 
If 75% of the country says that they're Christian, if 75% of this country was saved, it wouldn't be the way it is right now. So I'll just leave that with you like that. We're going to pray, uh, and we're going to ask the ushers to come forward. We're going to take communion. And I'm going to tell you this before we take the communion. If you're not saved, you shouldn't be taking communion. Yeah, I'm going under. It, if you're not saved, you shouldn't take it. And, and it's okay for you to not take it. And if you're here today and you say that, and you think you're not, come get me afterwards. And we're going to pray and we're going to go through this. And, and don't have any shame in saying, I really am not sure. I want to be sure. Okay? Uh, and if you know someone, let's keep them in prayer that the Holy Spirit would move upon them. Let's pray. Father God, I just pray over the entire congregation that is here today. Lord, every single person, that Lord, that they would take some time to examine themselves, Lord, to see whether we have loosed our grip on the things of this world. Lord, I wouldn't want anyone to do as a rich young ruler did, Father, to walk away sad where he kept his grip on his possessions of this world. He wasn't willing uh, to give it all up, uh, Lord, and that is what caused him to not be saved because of his tightening grip upon the material things of this world, Father God. Whether it be a family matter, whether it be a material possession, Father, uh, whether it be an ideology that we have, Father, that we should not have anything that is of this world that is hindering us uh, uh, from, from following you, uh, Lord. And what you require is our utter and total surrenderance uh, to your will, Father, to obey you uh, and, and to follow you and to be about your business. And, Lord, we, we do not walk in that uh, straight every single day, Father, because we have to deal with uh, the, the sinful world that we're living in and the flesh that we're in, Father God, but our pursuit uh, every day as born saved uh, born again and saved Christians, Father, is, is to sanctify ourselves every day uh, through, Lord, the Holy Spirit and through your shed blood and to be better and better and to have our life, Lord, in such a way that every hour of every day that we're becoming more Christ-like. And, Lord, we pray that you will help us to be able to do that uh, in, in our lives and help other people, Father God, as well. Uh, but, Lord, if there's anyone here today that has just been under this ruse that somehow they were saved, but Lord, they're thinking that maybe they aren't. Lord, I don't want to put doubt uh, in, in their mind. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be convicting them. And that Lord, that those of us, we know people that aren't saved. Father, that help us to be your ambassadors as to we go and present the gospel and talk to people and share your word, Lord, with people so that they would uh, have the opportunity, Father God, to be saved. Because you've told us that it's our, it's our commission to do this. You don't have to use us, but you choose to. And Lord, just use this church and bless them. And we pray this in Jesus' name.